ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಯುವರ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಕೇಕಂದ ಸರ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಮೀನ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟೂ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟರ್ಡ್ and then uh, close to 150 160 attend every day oh okay uh, of that uh, more than 150 of the total registered participants more than 150 are uh, faculty members okay uh, then we have uh, research scholars and then a few pg students so that is the uh, mix of the audience okay okay oh so my talk so. is not going to be too technical uh, yeah. not uh, it's also not too general <laughs> So okay okay, okay. i think that is what is required both uh, is right. there both is... are there both are there okay okay precisely that is what is required uh, okay okay sir uh, can you make me co-host sir you are co-host abhinaya uh, sir is there i made you co-host other... initially itself uh, sir uh, i think i mean what does that one, you uh, one uh, can you see the content sir that i am sharing yeah 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 you are sharing actually the uh, video so now i think i i uh, due to some problem i left the meeting sir can you help me oh is it okay 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 Yeah, now you are co-host, Abhinaya. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. okay abhinaya uh, so it is 9:15 uh, let people keep joining we will start abhinaya uh, you hear me no yes. sir you can hear me right 
Okay. So, uh, sir, uh, yes, yes, uh, I'll, I can hear it. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make you the presenter. Okay. Uh, okay. So, anyway, uh, there is a formal introduction. After that, you can start. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are into the last uh, day of the FDP, and this is going to be the last technical session. So, there is one more session, which is basically on, you know, life skills and uh, such uh, other things uh, on, on those things. Okay. So, uh, we have uh, with us today uh, our own faculty from the Department of uh, Physics. So, he is working in the area of air pollution, uh, precisely uh, on uh, sensors for air pollution. So, uh, we have a number of uh, collaborative activities. And it is not just that he does research, he converts that into uh, commercial products also. So that is uh, special with him. So uh, he has developed many instruments and not only, I mean, uh, those are not only used in India, even in the US. So uh, I request now Abhinaya to introduce the speaker formally. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, you are audible, Abhinaya. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to introduce Dr. Ravi Verma MK, uh, who will be our uh, uh, speaker today. Uh, Dr. Verma is currently a professor at Department of Physics, National Institute of Technology, Calicut. Uh, he completed his uh, PhD in Atmospheric Sciences uh, from Desert, Re Desert Research Institute, University of Nevada, USA. He completed his Master of Science in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences from McGrill University, Canada. He is also having a Master degree specialized in Advanced Particle Physics from University of Hyderabad, India. Sir's research area includes development of instrumentation for atmospheric, environmental and climatic application based on optics and spectroscopy, atmospheric optics and environmental measurement of greenhouse gases and aerosol, radioactive transfer and aerosol forcing on climate, both regional and global scale. Uh, re regarding the major R&D works conducted by Sir, uh, he has developed a multi-wavelength nephlometer for characterizing tropospheric aerosol, cavity enhanced adsorption spectroscopy for a trace gas pollutant monitoring. He has also developed a green laser transmitometer, cavity enhanced Fourier transform spectroscopy, high sensitive NO3 detection instrument and roadside ammonia measurement instruments. He was instrumental in developing a new radial plume mapping algorithm based on optical tomographic principle to characterize non-points ground, ground emission sources in terms, for, in terms of hotspot locations and quantifying emission fluxes of greenhouse gases. This development has been published as an US EPA test method under optical remote sensing for emission characterization from non-point sources. Sir is having number of publications in a well-reputed journals. We are very fortunate to have such an eminence person as a speaker today. Over to you, sir. So thank you, Abhinaya, for a uh, long introduction. Um, I think I can share my screen now, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. sir. Yeah, you are now the presenter. Yes. Okay, I'm going to share. You can see my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, and sir, uh, meanwhile, I may leave in between because I have some uh, other. Uh, That's okay. Uh, other, uh, uh, everyone else will be here. Huh? Okay, okay so. no worries, no worries. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Okay. 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 Now, um, uh, I, uh, my uh, topic of uh, lecture today is spectroscopic sensors application to air pollution. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, lecture, I have I split that into uh, two parts. First part is uh, optical remote sensing, uh, ground based actually ground based optical remote sensing. They are not. Uh, satellite based or a lidar kind of one uh, this is uh, some uh, localized uh, optical instrumentation for air pollution sensing and then the radial plume mapping that uh, aishwarya was uh, no, sorry abhinaya was uh, mentioning in her introduction 
uh, I will uh, I, I will explain some basics and some results of the radial flow mapping algorithm that is now uh, adopted as a method by US EPA. Uh, some applications of that. And uh, then second part uh, will deal with the point sensors. That means uh, uh, you extract the sample into the instrument and uh, you make the analysis. And uh, this is actually for high sensitivity applications. For high sensitivity application means they are not for greenhouse gases or anything like that. They are very, uh, very rare uh, trace species in the atmosphere. So uh, the development of optical methods, uh, a few uh, of those uh, in the, uh, and then uh, their applications that we have performed. So you can see that most of my lecture today is based on the kind of research and development uh, that I was involved directly or indirectly uh, in the past uh, 20 years. So I try to summarize this into uh, the topic uh, sensors and applications, spectroscopic sensors and applications. Okay, so coming into part one, um, before I actually enter into the instrumentation part, uh, the air pollution, the way we look at or the spectroscopists would like to look at our uh, the definition and uh, it is given as air pollution is the introduction of chemicals uh, or aerosols uh, into the atmosphere that cause harm or discomfort to humans or other living organism or cause damage to the environment. So they are split into two primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. First one are directly emitted as uh, from the source as itself. And second one is formed from chemical reactions. So in the second one, the secondary ones are the ones uh, they are very rare uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, they are short lived and they, they react, for example, nitrate radicals or OH radicals. So they are uh, trace species um, and they, 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 they uh, form chemical reactions uh, or they induce chemical reactions and then that can form into, for example, nitrate radicals can form acid rains. So that kind of things. But nitrate radical, radicals are very, very small in uh, the quantity that is present in the atmosphere. So maybe parts per trillion level. So normal spectroscopic measurements are not uh, good enough. And chemical methods are not good, they're good enough because they're radicals. And by the time you sample and take it to the lab, they, they are no longer there. Okay. Um, so, uh, some of the important anthropogenic pollutants that uh, man made pollutants that we can uh, spectroscopists uh, would like to measure or they have developed methods to measure uh, using optical methods are uh, SO2, NOx. NOx, uh, by NOx, I mean NO and NO2 primarily, but there are other uh, oxide, oxides of nitrogen sometimes classified into that. Then uh, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, they are split into two, either methane or non-methane emissions. And uh, plenty of uh, volatile organic compounds are uh, present in our uh, Indian atmosphere, uh, industrial areas also. Uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, um, particulate matter. I won't talk too much uh, about particulate matter today. Uh, very briefly about one aspect, but other than that, the particular matters are not uh, there today. Um, then ozone and uh, CFCs and ammonia, etc. So these uh, many of those can actually be uh, detected by optical methods. Uh, now, I want to point out that uh, uh, it's not too interesting to develop an optical method new sensors for CO2, uh, atmospheric CO2 measurements, because atmospheric CO2 is about 350 to 400 parts per million already in the atmosphere. It's quite a lot. So you don't need a really a new optical method or new methodologies to make uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide measurements. So, uh, but then we have nitrate radical kind of uh, uh, very low amount of trace species that we are targeting at. So you can see the aim of the discussion today will be mostly, uh, I mean, one part of will be mostly to, to look at the methodologies to 
uh, improve the sensitivity of uh, detection optically. And uh, the first part actually is going to be not worrying about the sensitivity, but to, to use uh, our uh, common knowledge to characterize the source. So I'll start from there. Uh, our uh, our discussion is mostly, I mean, this case is only about optical instruments. And the optical instruments, uh, when we try to make air pollution measurements, we primarily target uh, spatial and temporal uh, resolution of the pollutant monitoring, how fast we can measure um, and uh, how big of an area we can monitor. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, optical instruments are. Uh, there's no one single optical instrument that can cover the entire or measure the entire pollutant species. So uh, it is split into different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. You can go from uh, ultraviolet to I mean, some UCs are like sample BTEX, uh, benzene, chlorine, ethyl benzene, and xylene. So they are uh, monitored using uh, UV primary. I mean. UV will have maximum sensitivity, UV, UV part of the spectrum. Then there are visible, uh, nitrate radical, for example, is measured in the visible. NO2 has highest sensitivity in the visible. And then you have near infrared, for example, two number dialysis uh, based uh, instruments are in the near infrared. And then you have the infrared, which is uh, mid infrared and uh, up to 10 micrometers and about 10 micrometers, up to 20 micrometers. So the electromagnetic spectrum is very large. And uh, then depending upon the absorption of the gas that you want to measure, which part of the electromagnetic spectrum is that falling into? And according to that, uh, you make a, uh, an instrument for detecting that particular trace species. Uh, out of which uh, I would like to uh, mention a special instrument, which is Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, uh, which is very commonly used. We are, uh, I mean, many, many, many people use FTIR, but uh, what makes FTIR special is uh, a, a brief introduction of uh, FTIR will also be there in the, the future. So uh, optical sensing, what is optical sensing? Optical sensing is very simple. You have a light source and you have a detector and you have a sample in between. So the light from the light source is absorbed by the sample, and when you reach the detector, uh, one second, eh? I have some noise in the background. I have to ask them to stop. So I don't know how to do that. Um, um, so uh, the absorption by the sample. Uh, Absorption by the sample, uh, absorption of the light by the sample is quantified at the detector. And uh, uh, that loss of light is in turn uh, translated to the quantification of the absorbent, which is the trace pollutant. So the sample can be a, in a, inside a sampling compartment in the instrument, or it can be open path in the air. So, but basically you have a light source, your detector, and in between the sample and the amount of light lost is, is translated into the uh, quantification of the trace species. So a typical example uh, that I can show you here is a very really popular uh, figure from the internet, but very useful figure. If you look at the black uh, line, the envelope of, the, of, this, uh, of this plot, that is nothing but a black body spectrum uh, of 5,250 degrees Celsius. So that's basically the, the, the predicted the uh, Planck's law of the uh, sun, supposedly at, at 5,250. I mean, it doesn't have to be said, but that, that, that line fits to a measurement, the yellow measurement on the top of the atmosphere. So you can see that uh, a lot of light on the top of the atmosphere. And if you look at the red the one, that is at the sea level, measurements at the sea level. So you can see that a lot of uh, light is lost in the atmosphere. The difference between yellow and the red is the light lost in the atmosphere itself. And you can see that little, little uh, uh, lines, 
Okay, they are pointing down because they are absolute uh, loss of light. So sometimes the very sharp ones like oxygen, this oxygen line uh, or a band of water vapor and the carbon dioxide. So you can see that light lost in the atmosphere uh, at this at these uh, spe special bands or the wavelengths actually point to some absorbing species in the atmosphere and primarily that are uh, water vapor and um, uh, uh, water vapor and the carbon dioxide but then you can see oxygen and many other things uh, uh, so this is this is a spectroscopic information the source is the light and the sample is the atmosphere and the detector is at sea level so this this is the same same idea is translated into the instrumentation and the underlying law is the lambert beer law or beer law or I mean simply beer's law or beer lambert law whatever way you want to call it um, that is uh, um, suppose you have a light intensity incoming light intensity passing a distance b through the sample and output intensity is measured then the transmission transmission is given by p over p zero, nothing but e to the power minus alpha p. This exponential decay of light through the sample is predicted by the beer lambert law. And of course, that is true uh, for a linear regime. And uh, when you use FTAR, those pe those people in the audience that use FTAR knows that uh, there is an absorbance, and absorbance is given by log of one over t. Uh, many times uh, our in our chemical analysis uh, e the e is not the base logarithmic base e is not used the base logarithm of 10 is used it doesn't matter it's a 2.3 or 3 multiplicative factor uh, so uh, beer's law is the underlying so that's the only underlying principle that uh, we need to use but we need to make sure they are in the linear regime what is mean by linear regime where this particular uh, equation uh, holds true when too much light is uh, too much pollutants are the light is completely absorbed then of course this is not no longer valid uh, so uh, you can see from this is that uh, alpha b alpha is the absorption coefficient and b is the path length so you increase the path length more light can be lost uh, meaning uh, if you have a very very trace uh, amount of uh, pollutant is present, then if you can artificially increase the path, path length, then you have better sensitivity for detection. So that's, these are the things that we can uh, we can learn from this uh, particular uh, law of physics. So optical spectrometers primarily make use of uh, Lambert's clear law. And then next is the experimental part where what kind of light sources will be available? What kind of light sources are to be used? And what, uh, depending upon the light sources, what kind of de uh, detectors that can be used? Some of the detectors may be cooled detectors. Some of the detectors don't need cooling. Some of some are very high sensitive detectors like photo multiplier tube. Some are uh, not so. You know, some for some applications, such a high detection sensitivity is not needed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, light source and detector. Choosing light source and detector for specific uh, application is important. Then, I, I, like I said, it can be an extractive instrument or an open path instrument. Basically, you would pull the sample from the air into the instrument using a pump, and then your sampling volume is inside that instrument, and that's an extractive instrument because you extract the sample. And then the second part is uh, an open path uh, configuration, meaning you send the light into the atmosphere, you collect that either on the other side of the of the uh, path, or you bring it back to the air, a mirror on the other side, uh, and uh, then uh, that is your sample. So you don't disturb the sample; they are in C two detection, um, then and there. Okay, so these two configurations. So I I will. I will start with open path configuration in the first part uh, because I could uh, explain the algorithm for source characterization. And then the second part uh, for high sensitivity detection, I'll uh, use extract to uh, kind of uh, systems that we develop. So conventional uh, spectroscopy will have, uh, like, uh, like I said, uh, light source sample detector. So, Many many times 
uh, for open path uh, since uh, I mean these, 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 these instruments can also be used as ex in extractive mode, but uh, most uh, widely used to open path uh, instruments include the tunable diode lasers. Now tunable diode lasers are uh, diode lasers where uh, their wavelength of emission can be tuned a little bit just over an absorption line of one compound. So for uh, H2S or C2H4 or C2H2 or CH4 uh, or CO2 or CO2, anything, you will have one instrument for one, uh, one instrument for or one specific uh, wavelength for one, uh, one uh, pollutant. Whereas uh, uh, UV DOAS spreads through the UV and the visible part of the spectrum, for example, BTEX. BTEX will have uh, deep UV emissions like the 250 nanometer or something like that, uh, 250 to maybe 280 nanometer will give you benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, and xylene. Uh, then uh, uh, all, all those things. So particular matters are mentioned here. That is not a direct absorption measurement for particular matters, but they are because it's a broad measurements. Uh, some some atmospheric aerosol properties can be retrieved. Human tunable diode lasers are mostly, or at least they began in the near infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So basically, in all those instruments, you have a source. And uh, you use a telescope to transmit uh, into the atmosphere. It can go from several meters to several hundred meters to several kilometers. And the light, uh, you, you can have a detector on the other side. Then, uh, the, then, then it's difficult because the, the the electronics used in the source side, that information is not available on the detector side. So many times people use. Uh, a retro reflecting mirror. The retro reflector means the light will exactly reflect back to the where it comes from. So they are uh, nothing but corner cubes, basically corner cubes, and they are uh, accurate up to 22 degrees. So, uh, uh, so the shaking due to wind or anything like that. The plane mirrors are used. Uh, of course, the vibration will cause loss of light. It doesn't come exactly back. So retro reflecting mirror always are used. Uh, now. Uh, this laser based uh, optical instruments or uh, differential optical absorption spectrometer, UV based uh, spectrometers. Um, apart from that, um, we, 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 we have uh, FTIR used in the op open path. I mean, we, we have seen FTIRs in the, in the laboratories where you insert the sample uh, into the sample compartment, but you can also modify that. Uh, to make uh, open path measurements, but all these open path measurements actually measure path integrated concentration. Basically, it it measures the it adds the concentration from the source to the detector, and then you have so you basically if you divide by the path length, you will get the average concentration in the path. So they are not very really good for very small sources because then you detect very. I mean, if you use a large path to a small source, of course, your sensitivity is very poor. Uh, so these are mostly used for area sources. For example, uh, nitrogen dioxide uh, in urban uh, large cities. They are fairly fairly large area sources. But if you want to make a measurement of uh, nitrogen dioxide emission from a single vehicle, then maybe uh, this is not the way to go. But we are talking about the, uh, the the instrumentation that is used for area source characterization. The first part. So the, the, these open path instruments uh, are also sometimes called the path integrated optical remote sensing instruments or PIORS in, in short. Uh, if, uh, one of the recent developments that we made in uh, path integrated optical remote sensing is a simple instrument that uh, one of our students has done some exchange visits to Shanghai and then we developed it over there. And uh, this uh, building on the left is uh, University of Shanghai for Science and Technology, one of their buildings. And the, the top floor is their laboratory. They sent a laser beam across the highway. So the, the, the idea here was to make measurements uh, over the highway, uh, one of the main uh, highways uh, passing through the middle of the city. Uh, and then they used a retro reflector on top of a apartment complex on the other side of the highway. So total, this is the, 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 the path length, the, the separation between the buildings are 650 meters. So light will travel 
double of that 1,000, 1.3 kilometers before it goes into the detector on the same side of the instrument. So this was to measure. So they, they, they used the, or we used the two uh, lasers very close by, which is the MO2 absorption, which is on 405 nanometer and visible. Uh, we can still see that 405, I think. Uh, our eyes, eyes are still sensitive, I think. But never mind. So the retro reflector is on the other side. So light comes and uh, it takes 290 degree reflections and goes back to the detector. So this is about 1.3 kilometers back and forth. So this was to see whether there is any any specific uh, need for measurement over the highway because chemiluminescence detectors or MOX detectors usually are the point monitors and uh, they are kept. Uh, in the building and extract the samples from outside and uh, we have to see if uh, this makes uh, I mean these laser based instruments can be very fast uh, chemiluminescent detectors are not so fast uh, so we are trying to experiment uh, so this was published last year anyway so if you look at the time series of the measurements the instrument was made and they did two weeks of measurements in 2017 and we found that two parts per billion detection sensitivity of the instrument. And if you look at the black dots that is made by this instrument, the instrument is called open path because it's made open path. It's a dual beam, two lasers, huh? so dual beam laser spectrometer. And the red ones are chemiluminescent detectors. So you can see that chemiluminescent, these are our instruments were averaged to chemiluminescent detectors, but you can still see peaks occasionally that's because the uh, instrument the light beam is passing right over the traffic and uh, sometimes the uh, MO2 emissions are picked up very quickly whereas the chemiluminescence detector is sitting inside the building and it is it is uh, seeing the diffused uh, MO2 concentration so they are not seeing any spikes in the instrument so but if you take the one hour measurements uh, average over the 15 days uh, the general trend is the same. Only thing is that uh, laser instruments see every day. Laser instruments see the spikes uh, and the fall before the chemiluminescence detector because the chemiluminescence detector sees the NO2 almost 200 meters after the you know, source, whereas uh, the laser one will see immediately upon the detection. So it's a little so, but general trend and the and the and the and the and the and the levels are the same in the chemiluminescent detector. Not only one chemiluminescent detector, but uh, detection was also made a comparison between five of the chemiluminescent detectors in and around the area uh, within five kilometers of the, of the measurements. So open path uh, detection in the, in the takeaway from this experiment is that uh, it can be fast measurements. Uh, compared to chemiluminescence, more accurate measurements and uh, in situ measurements. This was published in 2002. So now having talked about those two or three different uh, open path uh, instruments, uh, I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, the most uh, important uh, instrument, uh, Michelson interferometer. Michelson interferometer, we all learned from our high school time that uh, uh, Michelson made the uh, this particular instrument to see whether ether was present and at that time where people were fighting whether light is a particle or a wave and uh, Michelson believed it is a wave and they, he was thinking that uh, ether is the medium to the electromagnetic like, light uh, propagates. Later on we know that ether is not there but Michelson was very clever in making this instrument uh, to try to detect either and he got a negative result and uh, he got Nobel Prize still for that. Uh, the only Nobel Prize uh, received for a negative result. Uh, however, um, I mean, the, 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 I mean, uh, uh, obviously it has very high value, that's why he got Nobel Prize. So Michelson interferometer is uh, having uh, a light source, Michelson used the sodium vapor uh, lamp. Uh, so one wavelength of emission, uh, yellow light, and it it passes. It, it it goes to a beam splitter. It splits 50-50. One 
half of that will go and hit a mirror and comes back and then hit the beam splitter and goes to a detector. The other half will go there to a mirror, come back to the detector and it will interfere at the detector. So light interference will take takes place and there's very slight uh, change in path length will introduce uh, the, 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 the interference fringes are formed and very slight change in path length is uh, uh, is introduced as a shift in the fringe and he tried to use the one beam in the direction of earth with respect to either and one perpendicular to it and he expected a fringe shift if he turned it to 90 degrees both to the perpendicular to the direction of earth propagation but anyway that's that's the old story and uh, he failed to see any fringe shift and the uh, experiment uh, couldn't find either so that's a negative result. Now, what does it have to do with uh, FTAR? So FTAR is nothing but a modified uh, Michelson interferometer. What is the modification? One of the mirrors is made to move. Uh, basically, it can move. Uh, you know, it can move back and forth and back and forth uh, a certain distance, x. Okay, and then. Uh, what happens is that when light is introduced, again, Michelson interferometer, it goes and uh, goes to the detector, the detector look at the uh, interference fringes. Now, when you have a sodium vapor lamp kind of single uh, wavelength, I mean, monochromatic light, you get fringes like that. But FTAR doesn't use a single wavelength. It uses uh, light, infrared light from a heating element. So, it will have all the wavelengths in the infrared. Hmm? And what will you get? You will get sum of all the interferences from all the wavelengths. Now, the, 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 the distance you move, the mirror moved, uh, and the, the interference fringe you get here, this is called the interferogram. You can use, uh, you know, you can use uh, Fourier transform. If you, if, you, if you use a Fourier transform of that signal, what you will get is, uh, if there is no absorbance, then what you get is the wave number versus intensity, that is the lamps uh, spectrum. And you can, you can see that uh, wherever light is missing, that actually gives you the uh, sample present in one of the Michelson's interferometer beam. So FTAR is a very beautiful instrument one of the best instruments physicists have ever made. Uh, so uh, it can span the entire, uh, I mean, two micrometer to 20 micrometer, that's a long wavelength band. And this little movement of the mirror can actually give you the uh, absorption spectrum of the entire uh, relevant infrared band. So that's the beauty of the instrument. So uh, this particular, uh, because of the span of the wavelength, the large band of the wavelength, it can detect uh, about 300 compounds uh, that are present in the atmosphere. I'm not going to go into the list. I'm just saying that. Uh, yeah. And uh, detection limit can be okay. I mean, it's a uh, one to ten parts per billion. Most of these compounds, and some of them can be more sensitive also. But uh, you can also adapt the FTAR into an open path instrument. But the only problem is that it is not uh, made of any lasers. So you cannot collimate the light into very long path and the maximum you can use is up to one kilometer. It's very rare. And we usually go from 200 to 500 meters uh, separation of path length. Uh, but again, uh, you need a time for the mirrors to scan and if you want to average about or accumulate about 10 or 20 scans, so it takes time. So they are not in millisecond measurements. They are, uh, time resolution is of the order of seconds to minutes, so several minutes of measurements may be necessary to obtain um, a usable concentration value. So this is the engineering part of it. Basically, you, you see a big uh, telescope, 12 inch mirrors are in the back, uh, telescopic mirrors, and then you see a small box on the top, which is the Michelson interferometer. And the interferometer pass the light into the telescope. It sends it to the atmosphere and bring it back. That's the telescope sends into the atmosphere and bring it back. And then we have some data analysis and some electronics in there. So 
uh, here the modifications what we made is to make the instruments and put it on a uh, on a what you call scanner something like a, uh, on a military grade uh, i mean they put the uh, radars or things like that on those scanners so this this can scan uh, horizontally and vertically so we put it on a scanner and then we put different retro reflectors on the ground so this is a method that we try to develop so instrument is not our develop i mean we, anyone can develop this instrument but um, but um, uh, the the method that uh, is what is more important here. Okay, so how do we do that? So this we place it in the ground and we scan from retro. This is just a control experiment. The first uh, experiments, uh, the very very first experiment that we did. So the instrument is old also in this case. So there is a gas release here. So this I think ethylene and acetylene were used. We cannot release methane or a substance there greenhouse gases so i think these are this is ethylene and acetylene release was there and uh, you scan and then you see whether the scanning and the making measurements can actually retrieve the uh, the, 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 the location of emission so the, the idea here is that uh, this can be a big one a big area and you can actually locate the emission sources uh, these are more important for uh, sources like landfills where uh, methane emissions can be found and capped let's see that's the first that's, that's where the fund came from originally now uh how do we find that you know we find that uh, using an algorithm called radio flow mapping this was fully developed by us uh, and uh, later adopted by us epa as a test method uh otm 10 after intensive demonstration so what what uh, I showed there is uh, part of the first demonstrations. And right now, I think this was 10 years ago. So I think now they are already adopted as a method. This is the adopted as test, test method, but now it is adopted as a method itself. It's a US EP approved method. Uh, and uh, it's a unique methodology for characterizing gaseous emissions. And it uses scanning path integrated optical remote sensing uh, instrument. Uh, it can be any in instrument, any optical instrument, but uh, the algorithm can be adopted for any path integrated optical sen sensor that can scan an area. It can scan horizontally or it can, can scan vertically. Both has its own purposes that we uh, that I'm going to. So we have horizontal scanning, which can find hot spots of emissions. Uh, you can do vertical scanning, which can actually, if you do the vertical scanning downwind of the area, then you can actually quantify the emissions, so many grams per second, so gram per hour, kilogram per hour, whatever is the emission rate that can be that can be that can be quantified. Obviously, you need the wind speed measurement and the direction measurements also. And, and then if you don't scan, uh, uh, I mean, if you don't scan an area or if you don't scan vertically, you can still scan along a line uh, that is a one dimensional. Uh, it's again radial. The radial means you sit in one place and uh, everything uh, around the circle, around the area is directed towards the center. So that's what we call it radial and we do the mapping of the flow. So if you look at the, uh, for EPA, what we did is that we we, we, we made a test area. We, we, we split into different pixels and each pixel will have one retro reflector that, uh, that represents the measurements in the pixel. And then we <clears throat> then we we scan through the area, and uh, obviously we use GPS coordinates and everything with respect to north angle was used. And the uh, path integrated optical remote sensor is here, and then we scan from mirror to mirror like that. You know, we can scan. It doesn't have to scan from one, two, three, four like that. It can scan from one direction to the other. Uh, it's okay. That the rest of things can be done. And in the vertical. When you have fugitive uh, area sources and you put the uh, retro reflectors in the downwind and you mount them on a scissor jack and then you can 
it has to be downwind. That's 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 a catch there. It has to be downwind, otherwise you will not see the cable fence. And then uh, one dimensional FPM actually is nearly along the line, and then you can see where, where with, between which which retroreflectors you get maximum concentration, and you can you can program that into or you can model that into, and then you can use a that measurements can be used to, to determine which uh, if you know the diffusion parameters or the wind speed attraction parameters, then you can actually model that back into where the source is and then what is the emission rate. So these are all for the ground based emissions. Yeah, you can release the source from the ground, but then algorithm will have to change. So the an example of the horizontal RPM. Like I showed you earlier, we had a 120 meter by 120 meter test area. We released the acetylene at this location. You see here, there is a circle, and the algorithm determined. So, about 10% uh, or I don't know, 15% uh, less than 15% error. That's okay. Um, you can see that uh, it can find. Uh, I mean, our pixels were also not very high resolution, so. The error also directly dependent on the number of retroreflectors you can use. So uh, this was optimized uh, for the cost plus uh, error, and then this gave. Sir, uh, you went on mute, sir. Varma, sir? Yeah, uh, might be. Uh, sir, you are in mute. Sir, you are muted. It's... Sir, it's not audible. Sir, it's not audible now. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now it's fine. I don't know. I did not unmute myself, but maybe uh, some buttons I <laughs> pressed might have. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry about that. Sir, uh, this slide actually, we couldn't uh, hear anything about this particular slide. Yeah, I, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. So we 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 made a, we made a control measurements, uh, which is uh, the control experiment to see the truth of our algorithm, and then we applied it that into a industrial wastewater treatment plant. So you can see uh, in the reality we cannot have our pixels uh, really nicely. So we have to we have to arrange it uh, such a way that uh, we we have to still break them into pixels for the algorithm to work. And the wind is coming from left to right. And uh, that, that's not that's actually not uh, important because these are horizontal radiopole mapping. So this particular uh, wastewater treatment plant was uh, they extended their facility for our testing for US EPA. Uh, and then what we found is that uh, you see this is heptane. So you can see that part of the tank, uh, that part of the facility was giving heptane. So there is a hot spot. There's one hot spot here also. And now I, I have no idea what that is an important one or not, but uh, the method was. Uh, uh, the, the, the method was being demonstrated, so we 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 put the pixels like that, four by two, uh, four by three, I think, twelve, twelve, twelve retro reflectors. Uh, so uh, one retro reflector per pixel. Uh, so we also found uh, dichloromethane uh, in uh, two locations of this industrial wastewater treatment plant. So basically, this is not. Uh, particularly meant for industrial wastewater treatment plant, but so those are the facilities at that time uh, available. Later on, we applied that into uh, a very big, large uh, or very large uh, closed uh, landfill also. Closed landfills are more important for CO2, I mean, methane emissions. So, um, in order to do the vertical setup, we use a, a scissor lift, you know, Scissor lifts can be used and put retro reflectors. So these retro reflectors, they are not glowing. They are, that's from the flash from the camera. So you can see that they really return the light 
back into the into the uh, system. So we released the ethylene. In this case, we released ethylene, and our actual uh, release was 0.11 gram per second, and we actually retrieved 0.103 grams per second. You can see that uh, uh, the this is the vertical plane measurement uh, measurement in the vertical plane, and we can actually see. We got a very nice uh, setup there. Wind was very favorable for that, and you can see that uh, wind was uh, between 10 degrees and minus 5 degrees so with respect to the perpendicular. And then the flux on the left, you know, the, the, the line is actually the actual release, and we are not very far from the actual flux, the measurement flux time series, you know, we can put that with time series. And the average was, uh, like I said, the average was 0 0.103 grams per second that we retrieved, but the actual. So, you can see that you can actually well, can be fiction which always shower it in the great card. Uh, okay, so we, uh, we actually, uh, did this, uh, experiment in a very large landfill, which is about 300. Uh, I, I think, um, very large, almost a kilometer long or half a kilometer long. And, uh, very wide. So we split into two, several sections, and you can see all the squares are the pixels that we, we measured. And what I'm going to show you is the long line at the edge uh, where we did the vertical uh, radial plane mapping. So you can see that there are multiple sources. This source is very close by, I mean, somewhere very close from this quadrant itself. And this one is wider, that means it's coming from far away. It's, it's because it gets wider as it uh, disperses as it moves forward. So, but we we we, we found about 9.6 grams per second uh, emissions from this landfill in 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 that particular in that uh, in that particular area. So that's uh, quite a bit of emission. So, what they wanted to know in this closed landfill is that where are the emissions of uh, methane and how much methane is emitted. So you can see that. Um, these are fairly simple methods and uh, fairly simple experiments and uh, even even with one experiment we can fairly uh, get the and you can actually make a, uh, as permanent installation and then you can scan and uh, it's not very high costing instrument it's a little bit of modification of FTIR and then it can very usefully apply directly into the uh, source characterization of the so this is this uh, I we used FTR because uh, methane was very easily targeted. So there's there's another uh, industrial facility. This is about one kilometer, uh, and uh, there, uh, near a railway track, we placed the retroreflectors. The blue lines are retroreflectors, and the FTR was scanning from last one. Then it scanned 180 degree. It turned around and scanned. So uh, half a kilometer one way. So we get one one kilometer very easily. Uh, so they have a power plant. They have some industrial uh, paint facilities, I think. And uh, this is actually a this is actually a military facility. Also, I think they were uh, they were they were having some paintings of their uh, small flights or something like that. I, we, we, I, I don't remember exactly, but uh, they 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 were the ones who extended much of the facilities for US EPA experiments, and they have a industrial wastewater treatment. And the other one, this is not the wastewater treatment plant I showed earlier. This is in North Carolina. So you can see that ethylene and acetylene came from this uh, near the power plant. Uh, we got the chlorodifluoromethane and bromodifluoromethane from the industrial plant, and methanol from other industrial plant. So. Uh, so you can see that this is why we used FTAR because you are not targeting one compound. You are checking out of the 300 compounds that it can measure which one is available. So um, I didn't speak much about the instrumentation and analysis part. They are also complicated enough, uh, but that requires a much different kind of specialty. Uh, I didn't want to go into detail. So this is direct application. So one instrument and its application. So it's uh, not very difficult to comprehend. But FTAR was chosen only because uh, it's complicated, but it, uh, I mean, analysis wise, it's complicated, but but now everything is automated anyway. So uh, in our case, we had to analyze spectrum by spectrum but these days. So they are all automated. Uh, and then here I'm going to talk to you uh, about its FTIR's usefulness. Um, this is a spectrum of 
tasks. Uh, so we made some particulate matters using fog oil. They have oils which you, upon heating, will produce fog uh, particulate matter. So it obscures your uh, vision visibility. Yeah, or these are dust and the fog oil experiments we did, and we only we didn't look at the absorption part. We looked at the baseline of the spectrum, and then baseline of the spectrum can be used to determine the particle. Uh, can characterize the particle. So I'm not going to detail into the measurements and and the theory behind it. But I can tell you that uh, there is an electron classical electromagnetic theory. One part of classical electromagnetic theory is called the Me theory. Me theory is the Me is the guy who actually it's also called the Me Lorentz theory. So Lorentz and the Me independently derived this theory of light scattering by particulate matter. So use that uh, in this baseline measurements. You can actually see that we could retrieve the particle size uh, size of the particle so it's a little noisy so our method is not perfect but the mean theory can be inverted to make the particle measurements the real measurements are given in the book so you can see that optical methods are uh, they don't they, they they are very useful if you can do that in a broad spectral uh, regime then many things uh, in the atmosphere as far as pollution is concerned can be uh, uh, retrieved from that. So this is the first. Uh, this completes the first part of the talk, and the second part uh, is regarding high sensitivity. So algorithm wise, it's done. So we can, we, we, if you have an path integrated optical remote sensing um, instrument, then you can use a remote sensing instrument to do uh, path integrated measurements, and then path integrated measurements scanned over an area. Uh, horizontally or vertically can actually characterize the ground based emission sources. So they are actually area sources that we targeted in that. So in the second part, uh, we are, uh, I'm going to talk about the instrument itself for making high sensitive uh, measurements. Okay, so high sensitive measurement, as I mentioned very briefly while discussing Pierre Lambert law, you have light in uh, to the sample and then your light out of the sample. So intensity or power coming in and coming out of the sample and the difference actually is, are, are the losses happened in the sample. Uh, you have a path length to the sample. Then you have uh, Pierre Lambert's law and you can get, uh, you can quantify the absorption in turn quantifies the amount of pollutant in the in the sampling area in grams, so I don't know, number per centimeter cube or whatever. So it's just one pass through the sample. Okay, so one pass through the sample, and we are looking for the increased sensitivity. That means absorption losses are very small. I in I is almost close to I in. So, but we can use uh, Lambert Beer absorption loss, and then losses are very small uh, exponential component can be expanded and then you get uh, some equation don't worry about the equations at all i equations i'm just showing for the sake of showing it just to show the difference in the i mean improvement that we made for the instrument for increasing the sensitivity so the alpha is the absorption coefficient we measure absorption coefficient here absorption coefficient can be converted if you know the absorption cross section you can convert that into number concentration directly so path length the intensity in intensity out okay so i think uh, i lost the term. so uh, absorption coefficient alpha d is the path length i is the i zero is the light in i is the light out so the approximate the equal to symbol is used because we use an approximation for exponential here and that can only be used if alpha is small that means very small amount of gases present Solution percent in the light bar. Now, uh, we learned that the, the more and more uh, length that the light can travel through the sample, better sensitivity is going to be because more, it gives more chance to, for the light to lose, and then quantification will be above the uh, noise level. So, what you do, you make two highly reflective mirrors on both sides. Now, they are not metal mirrors. They are uh, coating, uh, thin filling coating on the uh, 
uh, one side of the mirror, reflecting side of the mirror, uh, through a transparent uh, substrate, uh, and you put two mirrors. Okay, that it has optical prints. They are called optical resonators. So there are some conditions for resonators to work. So given that all those are satisfied, you put two mirrors on the other side. So most of the light is reflected back, useless, but some light gets in. So light gets in, little light leaks at the outside, then light reflects back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So they are not going down the axis. I just, uh, each time intensity getting lesser and lesser and lesser. So what happens is that if L is the loss, if R is a reflectivity, R1 means everything reflecting, L1 means everything is lost, R0 means nothing is reflecting, L0 means nothing is lost. So you simply have to see how at which points it is reflecting and that uh, uh, you know you, you you can use uh, you know one minus r one till you can you can simply write it as a small equation and then you add them up after each reflection then it nicely comes down to a geometrical series do not worry about the equations it's just showing it and for r less than one and l less than one which is true uh, the, the geometrical series will converge and then you can simply uh, uh, so this, this this method was uh, this method was uh, uh, developed in 2003 actually so you applied so all the mathematics is worked out in that particular paper and then you have multipass so basically reflectivity is the factor that uh, multiplies into the uh, so so you have a lot of reflections within the sample itself because of the high reflecting mirrors and then that increases the sensitivity that is the that's the simplest explanation that we can give so if you want to have a broad spectrum of uh, i mean if you use lasers there are problems because it can it can trigger the modes in the cavity uh, but uh, there are ways to get around that too but it's easy to use in a broad spectrum of uh, light then that's what exactly what we want so when broad spectrum is available, they are not like coherent resources like laser, they are incoherent light. So we call it incoherent broadband cavity enhanced uh, spectrometer, okay? So I will show you an important, uh, yet interesting uh, application that we did in the initial stages. Then I'll go into some important details and we'll find out the question. So, what I want to show here is that uh, this particular experiment was uh, done in Ireland. The earlier one was in the US, but this one was done in Ireland. So coast of the Ireland, uh, what happens is that there are, they, they found a lot of molecular iodine hanging around. Iodine has C molecule, iodine has iodine oxides, IO, and uh, uh, iodine uh, dioxide, I think, OIO or IO2, IO2 is also. So these iodine emissions are coming from the marine boundary layer, and then this uh, iodine emissions are causing a lot of uh, health issues as well as uh, visibility issues to, uh, in uh, along the coast of Ireland. So people start uh, making measurements, and uh, the biologists actually know that uh, these iodine emissions are coming from one particular sea algae uh, called the Laminaria digitata. So nobody has ever made a uh, specific uh, targeted measurements of this. So we thought that now we have a methodology for, uh, I mean, iodines are found in parts per trillion levels. So very, very, very high sensitive instruments are needed. People use the UV DOS instruments, a uh, 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 kilometer long path length to actually measure a little bit of iodine. But uh, we could, uh, we, we now that we have uh, a more sensitive technique to measure, we decided to pick this one from the sea and uh, make it to see whether they are actually uh, responsible for this high uh, iodine emissions along the coastal. So uh, uh, the target is iodine, they are very reactive species and they are, can be found in gaseous and particle phase. So this is the photograph of the uh, particular species that uh, we investigated called the Laminaria digitata. There are several seaweeds. Uh, and uh, biologists have found that 1% of the dry weight of this particular uh, CV is iodine, 1%, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. 
lot of uh, ideas. Um, biologists actually have a theory that uh, when uh, every every living organism have uh, this iodine present in their in their, in their uh, bodies, and uh, when they are stressed, uh, when hydrogen peroxide is released, H2O2 is released, and somehow H2O2 reacts uh, with iodine or uh, I think it's actually something that produces iodine that reduces the stress or something. I'm I'm actually not sure about that, but there is a theory like that. Uh, oxidative or any kind of stress will uh, produce H2O2 and then uh, in turn iodine emissions. But uh, this containing 1% of the dry weight is iodine. That means uh, we could easily see the iodine emissions from that. So we went and uh, picked with these things. So. This is the lamella digitaca. This uh, stick to the rock. Uh, they stick to the rock uh, uh, rocks, and then uh, you know, it has a hold fast. It has a style, and it has plates. Okay. So this is the photograph uh, of the place where we went and picked up. We pick up. So this is the sea, and you can see them. Uh, so it's not very easy to go into the sea and pick them up. Yeah, you have to dive. So there is another way to do that. Uh, what happens is that during uh, high tides, water will rise, and uh, these things will be carried over to the to the uh, shore. And uh, after the high tide is finished, uh, when it comes come low tide, the water will recede, but some of them will stay, and they get stressed because water is gone, and they produce iodine. So the the the, the, the reason people thought that initially thought that this was uh, uh, producing iodine because when people made the long term measurements, uh, they found that uh, according to the moon cycle, you know, uh, moon comes, I mean, high tide, high tide comes 14 days, then next 14 days, uh, after 14 days, it's low tide. So it's a cycle, goes with the moon. So people found that uh, iodine is emitting exactly, iodine, the amount of iodine emissions are exactly, time series is exactly. Following that cycle, so that's why something coming to the shore is so. This, this, these are the guys that they produce them. So we, anyway, our purpose is to see our instrument works or not. So we made an instrument. We made an instrument long enough so that uh, this guy can comfortably sit inside, and uh, um, optical windows are that present the light in. And uh, actually, we use the mirrors as the windows there, hypothetical mirrors as the windows there, and then we thermalized it. So that it runs in five degree Celsius, uh, the ocean temperature of the coast of Ireland, very cold area, uh, five degree Celsius, and then we made uh, we, we we calculated how much, uh, what is the volume and all kind of things. Uh, so ozone is generally giving stress to this uh, particle. So we actually we also wanted to contain the oxygen to I mean ozone to less than ten parts per billion by volume. Okay. So. Schematic. We have a xenon arc lamp. We collimate that in. We we, we use uh, optics to clean the beam, steer the beam, and then at the end of that, we actually make a spectrometer. So this is in the this is in the visible spectrum. So we don't need an FTIR. So we first uh, no sample. We make the measurements. Keep the sample. We make the measurements, and then of course we have the we have the equations developed before. So we use. Them. Calculate the extension coefficient. Basically, it's absorption coefficient because here the absorption is the thing. So, if you look at the, so this you can see the green is 530 to 515, 16 nanometers. So that's green, uh, green spectral region. And so you can see the red one is actually the measured iodine spectrum at this. So I didn't talk much about the instrument resolutions and all those things. So there are a lot of catch when you do instrumentation. You, you have to first characterize your instrument before you characterize the target compounds. Yeah, so instrument characterization includes its spectral resolutions and uh, all those things. So there are a lot of tricks and techniques behind that I didn't discuss. But anyway, the red one shows the iodine spectrum measured by people is available in the literature. And then our measurements, uh, the, the black dots actually exactly match. So we, we see iodine very nicely. And then we use a fit function to fit it to the Directly give us the directly give us the iodine concentrations. 
so you we, we, each one each one uh, we take and measure 24 hours you can see that the moment it it, it is it is kept uh, taken it gives a huge spike so it's stressed already we we, we pick it up we put it in a, uh, in, the, in the same environment same water and brought it to the lab and they kept uh, thermalized stable and everything so it was happy but when you take it out of the water and put it into the instrument immediately it is there is a big burst of iodine it's off the chart uh, this is another one this is one this is another. so we measure 24 hours and you can see that it it puts a little puffs of iodine time to time and eventually it dies i think it dies here yeah? and it stops puffing the so the first one is actually huge so another one so you can see the little burst of iodine uh, that was predicted by the plant, plant scientists. So that's called quasi oscillatory burst uh, when it is out of water uh, and then other characteristics. So basically, uh, the, the quasi oscillatory bursts have no characteristic uh, period. It is not reproducible from one uh, plant to other plant, but it is observed. Uh, we stopped there hmm? because the rest of the things, uh, I mean, we, we our, our idea was to prove the instrument can measure this and it was measured for the first time. Biologists don't do this. Biologists bring it, they dry it, they powder it, and then they start studying it. Yeah. So time series of uh, uh, emission by single uh, a single plant called thallus yeah? of the uh, See the laminated digitata was done for the first time and it was very useful. So we stopped there, but it can continue. Uh, anyway, we don't have we don't see this off the coast of India. So we don't see. So like I said, you know, uh, they, the application is here in the marine boundary layer, and uh, people have you can see that little rise and fall. Yeah, this is a high tide and low tide region, and that's the. So people measured with uh, very long path uh, differential optical absorption per kilometer. Uh, off the coast of Ireland, there was a four kilometer away, there was a small island. And uh, even there, that's how they found the iodine fluctuations, which uh, gave us, uh, gave us uh, the idea of doing this. And uh, you know, you can see that people population nature. So this is a very recent uh, study. So this is uh, our laboratory experiment using the method. And uh, what about uh, so? So uh, anyway, we have seen this. We have seen the, the oxidative stress, but we, we and we thought that anyway. I'm not going to explain that, but we thought that uh, what the plant scientists are saying is true. Hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide uh, reacting with iodine. It's actually reducing the stress of the biological species. That's what people say. So there are plenty of uh, species available, and uh, how much uh, iodine they emit, we do not know. We only went for laminaria. Now outside the laboratory. Uh, outside the laboratory, uh, of course, we have to package the. Uh, optical table set up on uh, on the optical table to an instrument right so what how how did we do? we can do two ways one is an extractive way pull the in, into the instrument then we have the optical cavity the optical resonator the tumor arrangement inside the instrument or something like that or we could split into two one is a transmitter component one is a retrieval component and the optical resonator is in between so it is a little bit of challenging to for the optical setup because uh, optics are, must be really really precise because light uh, wavelength is uh, I don't know 100 nanometers 500 nanometers and uh, if your placement of this uh, transmitter and receiver uh, boxes are not precise then it will be very difficult so but we we have we have came up with uh, some techniques to to, to, to to make this possible so we have a transmitter receiver arrangement for the first uh, measurements of this outside the so this is a the transmitter will have the light source it, it doesn't necessarily have to be xenon up lab but uh, we were very lucky to have a 
many times uh, resources can be lucky if someone helps you uh, with something. So we got a very special lamp from uh, Analytic Vienna in uh, Germany. Uh, they normally don't sell it out. It comes with their uh, atomic uh, at, uh, analyzer or something like that. So they gave us their one for this particular experiment. So it's very high bright, uh, you know, not lamp, but it has its uh, some stabilization issues. So we use stable. We we we, we, we devised our own method to make it stable. Then we use a telescope to send it out and the mirror. And in the receiver side, they have another mirror, collect the light out to the mirror and send it to the spectrum. So now, obviously, the reflectivity of the mirror is in the equation. So reflectivity is, I didn't speak about that, but the reflectivity determination, reflecti reflectivity is effective reflectivity, so that is not the manufacturer specific reflectivity of the mirrors. So you have to calibrate it. So determining the reflectivity of the mirrors, the effective reflectivity becomes the instrument calibration. So we have to, we can do that easily in the laboratory uh, by known calibration gases. But uh, when when in between the instrument components, it's an open path. You cannot really kill calibration gases. So, so we we devised the anyway, area. So very high bright uh, light source. So we came up with. Uh, uh, a way of calibrating it. We 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 anti-reflection coated the mirrors we specially made, and then whenever we want to whenever we want to calibrate the instrument after it's set up, we simply insert that uh, into the beam panel, and uh, after calibration we remove it. So this this will do the job of the calibration gas. So. So this this development took a little bit of time, and uh, because the methodology had to be developed and uh, corresponding algorithms for analysis had to be developed, and all all those things were developed, and uh, we took it out into field. So basically, you have a receiver unit uh, and a transmitter unit, and uh, you know all boxed up uh, from protecting from wind and rain. Ireland has a huge wind and huge rain. And uh, so we, we tried to make measurements here. It didn't, nothing, nothing actually happened. You know, we didn't see much of a pollutants there. Ireland is a very clean area. We didn't look for iodine there. We looked for something else. So we took it into a different uh, place called the atmospheric simulation chamber. It's a big Teflon bag. And we had a transmitter uh, on one side and receiver on the other side. And uh, inside uh, they, can, they can put it, put, uh, Pollutants into can simulate what is happening in the atmosphere, and they can they have shutter. They can close the shutter to simulate nighttime atmosphere and they open it up uh, for uh, sunlight daytime. So we we did that. So I'll simply show you the result from that. I don't uh, I'm not going to explain too much about that, but I think uh, well, it's interesting to see that. So transmit receiver components are there. So this is one day of experiment. Uh, this is a shutter or shutter was up so simulating night time so uh, you add a nitrogen dioxide and the ozone nitrogen dioxide and the ozone reacts to give nitrate radical that's no3 so you can see the no3 starts going up and you can see that parts per trillion you know so really highly sensitive very nice and the uncertainty is here you can see that the baseline is actually at about two parts per trillion and every five second measurements you can see that Definitely, this is a very sensitive uh, instrument. And uh, then this is a full day of experiment. Uh, it, they wanted to test their uh, simulation chamber also, blows at the wall and everything. So after a while, uh, it started uh, losing. Uh, that's because nitrate radicals are short lived. Uh, they transform to something else after some time and uh, some chemistry about it. So sometimes they, they stick to the wall then uh, say but fan was turned on then you can see that uh, increasing and uh, at about uh, 3 45 pm shutter was opened a sunlight come in and there you know three simply died because uh, it's highly photoreactive so you know three trace radicals are nighttime oxidants and they are responsible for acid rains etc okay Kindly, audience, mute yourself. Okay, uh, so so we see that uh, instrument is very sensitive, very nicely measuring very trace compounds. So optical methods are 
we can see that uh, we can measure time series. I mean, time resolution is very good. You don't have to bring any sample to the lab for analysis. You can then and there make measurements. So now, recently we applied this into, this is actually done in NIT Calicut, but with the help of a Canadian funding, we, we try to measure in the near infrared region. Uh, and actually this is for detecting and quantifying natural gas components. This is funding from Canada because they wanted to actually, they have long pipelines of natural gas. They have very high resource of natural gas and uh, time to time they have junction boxes. They have small buildings uh, and inside the buildings, if there is any leak happens, then they have to measure. And they don't need require, in, in fact, they don't require high sensitivity. They are looking at 400, 500 ppm or even thousand ppm of uh, gas leaking. Then only they need to detect. Small amount is always there. So we 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 didn't go for a very really high sensitive infrared or uh, even the UV region. We went for near infrared, it's just sensitive, just enough. But uh, we we made a methane, butane, uh, ethane, and uh, methane. Uh, four of for the main mixtures of 40 for 40 percent is methane and, uh, propane butane and uh, ethane are also present so we made some nice measurements and we first for the first time we published uh, near infrared cross sections of those three gases methane is uh, available in those three at the lower, for lower spectral resolution but never just between that and we got a really nice publication out of that uh, one of the uh, interesting study we did was in the total solar eclipse that happened in 2019, December 26. Uh, some of our PhD students took this instrument to, to Calicut City. It, it directly passed through Calicut City. We are on the edge actually for, of the total solar eclipse. So we went into the central Palayam West Stand, uh, city of Calicut. Uh, from time to time, they give up uh, their uh, building for. Uh, Measurements. They say Kerala Pollution Control Board. Uh, um, normal measurements are also there for any temperature wind. So we we try to place it next to them so that they, in case uh, if we could use their auxiliary measurements, they they, they usually provide it to us. Uh, so for total eclipse, uh, what we wanted to see is that where uh, can we actually measure the change in uh, trace gases. Uh, but actually, we were targeting NO3 because NO3 is a nighttime oxidant. They're normally not present in the in the daytime. Uh, but solar eclipse, during solar eclipse, these is present or not. However, we actually didn't find it. But I thought it's worth mentioning that. But we did uh, look at the ozone and uh, NO and NO2. NO2 is not shown here, actually. So we, some some differences we saw, but uh, we, our instrument is not necessary to see this uh, uh, other conventional ones because ozone, NO2, and uh, they are all abundant. It's a city area, yeah. But uh, we were trying to look at two compounds. One is uh, nitrous acid, H-O-N-O, and one was NO3, but uh, we, we couldn't find both about the detection rate of the instrument, so we, we, we were not able to confirm anything. That's a negative result, but negative, not not a negative. That's a lack of sensitivity of the instrument. So it's actually not a negative result. I should be clear that. Okay. Now we also took the instrument on another occasion, just before that. Uh, this is the bus stand, and the instrument location is here. And this is the bus stand, and I think uh, instrument location is here. And I think the next to that is a vegetable sorting area. So we found that uh, in the night time, after 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning, uh, trucks uh, from nearby states come there. They, they run idle. A diesel engines run idle. And uh, during the loading, unloading, sorting, and distribution of the vegetables. So uh, it's only half a kilometer area, but to one of the other vehicles will come and they sit idle. So that means a lot of pollutants must be coming during that time. So we wanted to look for NO3 during that time. And actually we found NO3, but I'm not going to show you NO3 that here. We also, interestingly, we found that uh, during early morning hours, they burn uh, little woods, yeah? 
uh, the tomato boxes there I think they, they burn the woods before the people wake up all those things are cleaned yeah so we made an instrument uh, we have a very new but very powerful uh, laser driven light source but this is actually again uh, not a laser source uh, it's actually a arc lamp but uh, laser driven means uh, it creates plasma it is very like a hotspot zero dark lamp and then we use it's much stable but very powerful and expensive instrument but we, we have one uh, then uh, we use an optical cavity and uh, spectrometer so what we did is that we left it open so wind uh, will carry over so we we we, we wanted this we, we noticed that a uh, couple of days so the last day of the measurement campaign in the last two days actually we set this uh, instrument up uh, in addition to the notary. So what we found is interesting. We found the uh, glyoxel. So glyoxel, glyoxel is actually not considered as a huge pollutant uh, in most of the places, it, but it, it does, it, it has its presence in the atmosphere, uh, very rarely studied uh, or uh, I mean, some cities, Hong Kong and Los Angeles, I mean, some cities they have studied and published, but in India, the rest, you can see it. So, but, it's a pyrogenic source when the woods are burned uh, these things come out uh, so they are actually present i don't know if they're toxic or not but you can see that significantly present in one burning incident uh, we found uh, 10 parts per billion that's quite a bit and uh, to confirm our measurements we also measured no2 see no2 so you can see that uh, NO2 is also there and the glyoxyl also present. And the right side, actually, you see not a time series. This is the time series, uh, 12 a.m. to 7 a.m. measurements. This this is actually we call, we call it a spectral fit. Basically, we make the measurements of the spectrum in the in the spectrometer. And when when all those pass each spectrum, we can take and we can actually see, look at the absorption cross-section of each compound and we can actually look at the spectrum and see if they are present everything else is removed and this should remain and you can see that uh, this is no2 uh, uh, measurements uh, and this is the glyoxyl measurements so both are really present in the uh, both are really present in the so we, we we could confirm so we can confirm looking at the spectrum if the compounds are present or we, we confirmed so they are pyrogenic sources of glyoxyl was present uh, in the atmosphere so anyway NO2 and NO3 are also there, but uh, I thought that this is more interesting. This is the first time we found. It's actually 2018, <clears throat> not 19. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude uh, my uh, discussions regarding spectrometers, optical techniques for measuring uh, pollutants and their applications uh, by adding uh, uh some algorithms home, home developed algorithms so all of them are so you you don't unless you actually look into the publications uh, you don't see this uh, readily available but as you can see that uh, we not only try to make measurements and publications we also try to make it more applicable for example we push the, the and submitted the documents and uh, USCPA and uh, USCP is really nice to give us some funds to make these measurements and uh, many industrial facilities and the military uh, actually extended their uh, facilities to to to, to for us to make this uh, uh, to to validate these techniques and eventually USCPA adopted that so uh, so we could see that with you know such developments can actually be applied to the betterment of the society. So we are not only developing the methods, we are also trying to apply the methods for the uh, uh, betterment. Uh, so uh, second part, uh, of course, is purely uh, instrument development and a few applications. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I may be a little early, but uh, so that piece is more questions if you have any that I can answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your in-depth presentation, sir. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. Maybe okay. I will read out those. And after that, the forum will be open for participants to directly interact with the expert. 
point. The first question is uh, application oriented or boost confidence in air quality measurement simply and cost effective. It's a compliment. I felt it's a question. I felt it's a compliment to you, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I hope others are like uh, they have given much, much con uh, compliments to your presentation, sir. <laughs> I'm not reading it one by one. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, now the uh, forum is open for the participants to interact directly with the expert. You can unmute yourself and you can interact. You can put forward the questions. Uh, sir, myself, uh, Rajin Dikchit. And uh, I'll listen very carefully whenever you are talking about uh, the FTIR. So I am interested to know uh, if uh, I'm operating on FTIR and finding a lot of noise in particular data. So there is any trick or there, there are any specific um, settings in FTIR setting where we can find particular frequency of the sample. Um, which FTIR you are using? Uh, I exactly, I don't remember here what is the model, but very, very latest. Uh, I'm working at Central University, so that is the very latest FTR. Yeah, okay, okay. That, that's okay. I, I just want to know because I am familiar with a few of them. That's, that's uh, it's not important. But um, you are using, you are bringing the sample and inserting it into the sample compartment, right? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, so you are looking for specific compounds and they, are you sure they uh, actually sir a problem is that uh, i am using the sample with kvr and uh, maximum noise uh, i think arouse uh, due to kvr ah but, uh, kvr but, yeah, yeah, yes kbr uh, you are using the bean splitter kbr right so yes, that, that is uh, water absorbing it may get uh, dark and your transmittance might uh, reduce that could yes. be one reason that could be one reason but other than that ftr per se unless the so is, is, there is, any, is there any possibility to reduce that uh, noise no. no you if the noise is uh, random or i i don't know you can you have noise reducing techniques but you don't you don't get to do that in normal ftr because you is a push and they get the result right or are you able to get the spectrum and you analyze yourself? Okay, sir. So that's that's the problem. You may not be able to analyze the spectrum yourself. They give you the software, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that is the problem. You will have to replace that the KBR, I think. I, I don't know. I, I unless I see the spectrum, I cannot comment more than this. But I think that's the reason. But FTR is certainly a very powerful instrument, whether it is in the lab or outside lab, it gives you full spectrum. There must be some other reason for that, maybe alignment or something. You may need to cons consult. If it's a new instrument, you must definitely consult your manufacturer. Okay, thank you, sir. Participants, any other questions from your side? Uh, there is a question from one participant. How to apply FTAR for concrete samples? Oh, I have no idea. Because uh, it will only work for absorbing uh, uh, compounds. So, okay. it will not pass through the concrete sample. I, I don't think so. Okay, sir. So, okay. Uh, Okay, fine. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there is no other questions, shall we conclude? I should. Yeah. yeah, we can conclude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Ravi Verma, sir, for this uh, very nice presentation on these different sensor techniques. I hope that the participants also like got a very uh, new information about these different sensors and its application in this uh, monitoring of the different uh, pollutants. Uh, thank you very much, sir.
thank you thank you I thank you on behalf of the organizing committee and on behalf of, behalf of the participants and the civil engineering department for this wonderful presentation so thank, thank you. you very much sir thank you bye Uh, participants, there are a few instructions for you people. Uh, today we are planning to conduct the exams uh, using Google platform, that is Google Classroom. We will share you the classroom key shortly, or maybe within uh, one second, actually. So we will share that classroom code here in the chat box. So using the classroom code, you can join the classroom. Maybe. And the link for the exam uh, will be shared in the Google Classroom. Uh, Ma'am, actually, I'm just uh, one minute. I'm trying to share it over here itself. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, can you also uh, share the link uh, uh, on? Uh, this chat box itself, uh, will it be held on Google Forms exactly or Google? How uh, it, be right? it is, so we have Google created a Google Classroom. Uh, so yeah. the exam will be conducted through the classroom. So you have to just uh, log in into your classroom. You have to join the classroom and there will be uh, sharing that Google form for your <laughs> feedback as well as for your exam. Yeah, we'll share it also on the on the WhatsApp group. Also, we'll share the code, the classroom code. Yeah, I present the classroom keys on the screen. Uh, I hope it is visible to all of you. You can join. Uh, the key is three small s j w two seven and w eighteen. And one more instruction, actually. Uh, if you're having any problem or any clarifications regarding the attendance, you can write to me. I will share you your individual data, like when you have entered into the session, uh, how much was the screening time, and all, the, all, all those data are with us. If you want, I can share it individually. And, and unless if you're not having any queries, don't write. If you're having queries, you can write. And always keep, in, uh, keep one thing in mind, we have given attendance only to the participants who have attended that particular session at least for 40 to 50 minutes of time. Uh, sorry, 50 percentage of the time. 40 to 50 percentage of the time. It's a cumulative. Many of the cases, like many participants, uh, because of network or because of any other reason, they have entered, they were there, and they have left, again entered. We have considered that. Cumulatively, if the participant was in that particular session for 40 to 50 minutes, 50 percentage of the time, sorry, we have given attendance or we are giving attendance, okay? And uh, few people, yes, there may be some query. The reason behind is you people have uh, entered with multiple mail IDs. So the registered mail ID is entirely different. The day one mail ID is entirely different from day two mail ID, okay? So multiple mail IDs, it has created uh, lots of confusion with uh, us also in the coding, whatever we have written also. So uh, those people, you can try to us and we will try to clarify with your uh, doubts. In that case, write the different mail IDs you have used also. Okay, so that will help her to sort the issue at the earliest. And uh, uh, Shortly, I will share you the attendance for the first four days. Anyway, first day attendance already shared. Another three days attendance I will be sharing shortly. And today's attendance, by the end of the day, we will be able to share. End of the day in the sense tonight. Because system will take some time to update everything in the cloud. And after that, only we can able to retrieve. Okay. So, uh, uh, any other doubts, if you're having, you can put forward. Uh, regarding the exams, you may be having 20 to 25 questions. Uh, it's purely objective time. And uh, yeah. yeah. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah, yes. uh, this is Sudhanshu Kamat here uh, from NMMS Mumbai. Uh, as far as Google Classroom is concerned, uh, the email ID which we have registered, which I have registered, is my official email ID of my institute. So um, kindly note that. Uh, uh, 
So do one thing, sir. Actually, uh, we are just retrieving the data on two bases. One is registered name, as you have registered in the Atel portal, and second is registered mail ID. At least one should be saved. No, no, I'm talking about the classes. I'm talking about no, the no. online quiz. No, no, fine. Actually, there we will be having the first page of your class test will be your personal yeah. data. Okay, so there you can enter the okay, personal fine. data starting like uh, your name, mail ID, and all. Excuse me, sir. Oh, please please make sure at least your name is your registered name. And in case if you are joining with a different mail ID, at least we can match that with your registered name. In some cases, we are finding it very difficult to uh, like match your email ID with the name because you are writing your name in different yeah, ways. Excuse me. And your email ID is also different. Okay. Yeah. Tell I, me. I have to say something. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes, you can tell. Okay. I don't the, know. That's all I want to say it. because since if we are going to say that it will be held in the Google Classroom. And so I have not not received any invitation from your side so that I can enter it. What is my uh, suggestion instead of that, if at two thirty you simply share the link of the Google form in the chat so that each everyone can join it from that link itself. There's no need of the Google Classroom then. Sir, the thing is that we are making it as a Google Classroom so that if you want to see your individual box, you can do that. Otherwise, we will not be in a position to sell you tell you the individual box. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. It's now. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know how to log in in Google Classroom because I didn't find any mail from your side today. Okay. So no, no. What you can do is that you can just type uh, classroom dot Google, so it will take you to the Google Classroom web page. So there you have the, you'll find how to join the classroom. In the Google only, right? I need yeah, to the search. Google. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So there, when you try to join a classroom, it will ask you for a classroom code. So there, you can enter this classroom code so that you can join the class. Um, uh, um, there is a query. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I've accessed the Google Classroom and I've uh, typed the code, but it is uh, asking to switch to the current uh, correct contact your teacher. It's not allowing, ma'am. Uh, no, I uh, just, uh, can you look into the screen once actually, uh, just click this option at the side at the right hand side corner. Okay. The plus button over here. Plus, just sir. click and uh, here you can give the codes, whatever yes. it's been shared in the screen before, then automatically it will be taking you to the classroom. Yeah, and you can just click the join the join button there. So yes. when you're joining for the first time, this will be enabled. I I so, did that. I did that, and uh, it's telling that I'm not eligible to uh, sit there. I don't know. Uh, Ma'am, uh, some same issue here. Uh, it is not written like that, but uh, it asks me to switch my account. Whereas I've uh, I've used my registered mail ID. Yeah, same, same. The code, the code looks correct, but your account can't access this class. Switch to the correct account for classroom or contact your teacher. Yeah, as far as left. Okay, ma'am. Actually, let us look from our side. Actually, uh, just give us five ten minutes. We will try to retrieve it. Okay. Sir, this is. I am also issue, uh, having the same issues. <laughs> Okay, fine. Actually, we will come back again after five ten minutes. Let us look from our side. Actually, what are the other possible ways to add on you all to the class? And if there is other way, we will do that. Uh, otherwise, we will just think of alternative option. Okay, please wait for five ten minutes. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. Can you speak a little louder? Ma'am, can you fill up the feedback form? Feedback form. It will be opened like uh, after three thirty. Yeah, you need to fill the feedback feedback form now. That will do within the afternoon session. Google Classroom, ma'am. 
Uh, you can try using the link that is shared here for the classroom. Just try using that link and the code that is being shared. Uh, one minute, ma'am. One minute. One minute, ma'am. I will respond to you. One minute. Uh, Sri Devi, ma'am, just wait for a minute. I will respond to you. Just wait for a minute. 